opportunity to kind of share the knowledge I've gained over the years on this issue. Um, I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll leave uh, much more aware of the issue and, and what you might be able to do at your own homes and cottages and even in, in your own uh, municipalities with your local council. But what I'll start with first is just a little bit of, of uh, detail about our organization and how we came to be, and then I'll get into the nitty gritty of the issue. So as was mentioned, um, uh, FLAP uh, actually was founded back in 1993. Um, it's actually officially uh, in a, a month from now, it's going to be our 30th anniversary. And through the years, uh, we've been starting to address a variety of efforts to try and mitigate the concern of bird collisions with buildings. Um, the primary areas that we focus on, uh, first and foremost, we're focusing on guidelines, policies, and standards developments for municipalities and government agencies across, probably not across the world in many cases now too, uh, but primarily right here in, in Canada. Um, we work uh, to, uh, on advocacy and education, we collect data and do research on, on the birds we pick up, and then we have our bird rescue program as well, where volunteers hit the streets uh, all over Toronto and outside of Toronto looking for birds that fight with buildings. And then we have a variety of different programs in place to kind of address those various efforts. Um, FLAP, uh, as I mentioned, it was back in 1993 when we started. And when we started as a very small core group of individuals, we actually focused entirely on the nighttime issue, uh, trying to get the city of Toronto's lights uh, turned off during the migration seasons. And we struck a partnership with World Wildlife Fund Canada, and we launched the first ever bird friendly building program. But as a result of going out and doing these patrols pre-dawn, we discovered that when we stuck around after daybreak, there was this whole other wave of collisions that would take place. Um, in fact, most of these strikes turned out to be a daytime related. And that's where I'm going to really get into the detail here later on, on how you might be able to mitigate this concern. So after uh, a flap started back in 1993, we, we didn't intentionally do this, but we started a movement. But there's now 40 different flap life initiatives across North America focusing on this concern in their regions. And it continues to grow. Uh, the bulk of these efforts uh, continue to come out of the United States, but we're, we're finding more and more Canadian cities are starting to establish their own flap-like flap initiatives to, to address this concern. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, there's the nighttime issue uh, where birds during the migration seasons, they're attracted to bright lights of large urban centers, um, like, like the city of Toronto. It isn't limited to large urban centers. It could be uh, an emission stack uh, in the middle of nowhere. It could be a lighthouse that uh, is known to take birds' lives at night, uh, all of which you know, can pose a threat to these nocturnal migrants. But then there's also the daytime issue where um, the windows that we put into the landscape deceive birds. Uh, it's the transparent qualities of glass where birds are seeing directly through those transparent walls to the adjacent side. To, could be a plant life on the adjacent side of a window, it could be a corner glass, um, and they, they try to fly towards that. Or it's the reflection of that habitat that they perceive as the real thing. And, and this is where your homes and cottages uh, fall uh, under this risk. It's, it's, it's the window collision issue during the day. Nighttime collisions at single family dwellings and cottages tend to be few and far apart. Um, the focus needs to be on mitigating the concern uh, during the day. Now, I mentioned one example of uh, uh, lights at night that have historically posed a threat to bird are lighthouses. And one of the highest uh, accounts of bird death was reported back in 1912. Um, and, you know, an, the illustrator here tried to demonstrate that the magnitude of of birds that were flying toward the beacon of light at this lighthouse in a single night. Um, I can give you a local example, not so much of a lighthouse, but it was an emission stack. Uh, in Kingston, Ontario, there, there's actually two emission stacks at the hydro generation plant that sit right up against the Great Lakes there, right, at, right up against Lake Ontario. And back in 1993, there was uh, a record break, breaking number of birds, uh, some over 10,000 birds that were reported to collide with those emission stacks over a two day period, um, where they just flew into those beacons of spotlights that were emitting uh, flood lighting the emission stacks and were either dropping from exhaustion from that light source by circling in that light, 
or they were colliding outright with the emission stacks themselves. And what happened was a study was uh, conducted to try and understand this better. They, they determined what they pretty much already knew. It was the lights. And what they did is they got rid of the floodlight system and put in strobe lights. And the, the problem almost virtually disappeared. So the issue of addressing the nighttime concern is so simple. How often can you say at the flick of a switch, you can make a problem disappear? And it is literally that easy to address when it comes to the concern of air collisions with lit structures. Um, then we have the, the, the window, uh, the evolution of the window collision issue. Uh, glass uh, first appeared in the, on the landscape back in uh, the 2000, uh, 12,000. Um, and it, it continued to evolve slowly but surely through those following years. But it was in, in 1845 when the glass world really began to change significantly, where it became a really big concern for birds. And it's simply the manufacturing process was being perfected, and they were able to provide a much more sheen, more glossy, uh, uninterrupted uh, surface, polished surface of, of glass, which is where it became a that it became that much more deceiving to birds, both in the transparent qualities and in the reflective qualities of glass. And here we are today, uh, just beginning to take this this evolution of glass to the extreme by by not only increasing these reflective qualities, but planting structures in the natural habitat. Um, where they just reflect the surrounding environment to such a degree that even human beings are known to collide with these types of structures. This particular image you see here are, are, is a, a concerning industry that is slowly but surely growing in popularity. They're called glass cabins, and basically they rent these out, where they drop these glass cubes into forests, where those people can rent those spaces reside in those cabins during their stay, but the cabins in, themselves disappear into the environment um, where they just be, don't become a visually obtrusion for those people. But quite frankly, it has introduced a horrible increase in the threat of bird death. And you can understand why. These, these, these uh, structures, they, they disappear wherever they're put. So we need to change this evolution to make windows as visible as possible to birds as we possibly can. And I, as I said, I'm gonna give you examples of how you might be able to uh, address that in the coming slides. But this is just an example of how extreme glass and, and its reflective qualities will go where people are now attempting to make their glass, sorry, their um, the fences that divide their properties disappear by making them mirrored as well. So we need to get away from this and away as fast as we possibly can. And why? Bird collisions with buildings is now considered the second leading cause of bird death across North America, second only to cats. And even that is debatable. Uh, it's, it doesn't mean that one's more important than the other. They are both horrible killers of birds, but um, the, the numbers that reflect bird collisions uh, are still really much at their infant stage. If there's a lot we still have to learn about those numbers, but the bottom line is over a billion birds die. That works out to roughly 32 birds every second is dying across North America. And you can understand why this has now become such a significant concern amongst industry professionals, government agencies, uh, members of the public. In that though, it's important to understand that it isn't, as you can see, the primary threat aren't tall high rises. It's low mid rise structures and homes. These are the root cause of this problem. And, and so we're uh, at FLAP, we're trying all different kinds of efforts to try and, and address this concern. And again, I'll get into that as we go through. But here are examples of types of structures. It's your homes, your cottages, condos and apartments, bus shelters, even your vehicles, uh, sound barriers, transparent railing systems. Transparent railing systems have become incredibly popular. People are getting away from their spindled railings on their porches, and they're introducing transparent railings. And why? They can sit in the shelter of their porch. They can have the safety that they're not going to fall off their porch, but they have an uninterrupted view of their lake or their backyard. And unfortunately, this particular industry has made the problem yet again 
incredibly difficult for the birds. Please, if you're considering getting transparent railing systems, stay with your spindles. If you have transparent railing systems, please consider going back <laughs> to the old school spindle approach or treat those transparent railings like you would your window on your home. And I'll give you those methods in a little while. And then lastly, your workplace. Uh, from low rise structures to high rise structures, cover it with glazing, very popular style of architecture. It's no wonder that a bird at every turn at some point in time is going to encounter a structure with a window and will most likely collide with that structure. So what are the birds that we encounter that are, are typically vulnerable to collisions? Well, it's big. Uh, FLAP itself, just in Toronto alone, has picked up 172 different species of birds. The image you see here is one of our bird layouts, um, uh, where we all the birds from the previous year, they're, they're retained in a freezer, they're tagged, and at the following year, we pull them all out and we do these bird layouts as an educational component uh, to the members of the public. We typically do this at the Royal Ontario Museum. And you can see that the, the magnitude that a very small core group of volunteers can pick up from just a handful of buildings when they're looking for them. Now, some of the more common species we pick are, are birds like the white-throated sparrow, uh, the oven bird, and the ruby-throated hummingbird. But then we also pick up listed species. These are examples here, the Canada warbler, the Eastern whippoorwill, and the wood thrush. Uh, we've now picked up 24 species at risk that are, are colliding with Toronto's buildings. Now, to put this into context, we did the, the, the numbers on how many birds we, we actually monitor in the city of Toronto that have glass. And we monitor 0.0001% of all the structures for the city of Toronto that have the potential to harm or kill birds. So you can, you can imagine we're only touching the tip of the iceberg just for the city of Toronto alone. Now, why is it the city of Toronto, like many cities uh, of, of its kind, is such a problem? Uh, you have to first look at the, the migratory corridors that are out there. There's, there's four major migratory corridors that represent North America. There's the Pacific, the Central, the Mississippi, and the Atlantic corridors. Now, when we use the term corridor, people picture like a highway where all the birds are funneled into a very tight space and they're following this tight corridor. It doesn't work that way. Technically speaking, North America is one massive migratory corridor. However, there are areas where those corridors overlap, which means there's a higher concentration of birds traveling through those regions. And Toronto, number one, sits beneath that overlapping corridors, those overlapping corridors between the Mississippi and the Atlantic corridor. Uh, not only that, Toronto sits up against a large body of water. And statistically, any large urban center sitting up against a large body of water has a higher collision count because birds follow shoreline. They use those as, as nav navigational aids during their migration to get from A to B, or they fall out on those shorelines to rest before they continue on with their migration. So this is one of the reasons, a few of the reasons why Toronto has a significant problem. The other reason is Toronto is a very green city. But so are so many other cities, you know, uh, uh, across North America. And it's no wonder that this, again, is such a significant problem. Now, this is the part that I think is going to fascinate you. I mentioned how tall high rises really aren't the root of the problem. Any structure with glass has the potential to kill birds. In fact, some of the structures we monitor that are among the worst are two, three, maybe four stories high. They aren't the 40, 50 story high rises. And it's simply because the, the areas that these uh, buildings uh, are exposed to in the topography, um, if they are sitting up against say uh, a forest or beautifully landscaped property and all that vegetation is reflecting in those windows, birds are gonna collide with them. And statistically speaking, the average tree canopy height for the Ontario region is roughly 60 meters. There are uh, obviously species of plants taller than that, but on the average, it's 16 meters, even 20 meters, I think is reasonable to, to say. So the bulk of these collisions are occurring at those levels because the birds, what they do is they've migrated throughout the night 
they fall to the ground after their migration. And the first thing they do is immediately start to replenish their energy levels by foraging through the trees. And they're moving through the tree canopy. They're hopping from tree to tree, either eating insects or eating seeds and moving to the next tree. And unbeknownst to them, the next tree they're flying to is in fact a reflection of the tree they just left. So this is why your homes are in the hot spot for bird collisions. And why, again, it's so important that you, you consider treating them. Now, if I can use Toronto as an example in terms of numbers, it's estimated that upwards of a million birds die each year in collisions with Toronto's buildings. That's just the city of Toronto, a million birds. I can't even wrap my head around that. <laughs> you know, and that's just each year. So again, uh, just all the more reason we need to focus on this issue. Now, the good news is through the years uh, and the, the various efforts that FLAP has been doing, um, we, we partnered back in um, 2005 with the city of Toronto. And with them, we developed the first of its kind bird-friendly development guidelines. And basically, it was a, a guiding document for architects and designers when they, when they design new buildings on how to keep the bird collision issue in mind in their designs. Well, wouldn't you know it that this particular set of guidelines has now been used for municipalities all across North America into Europe. And we're seeing all kinds of regions just across Ontario. There's now 20 different municipalities that have introduced mandatory requirements for new construction in their regions. And there's now a pending eight municipalities about to launch these mandatory requirements. So the good news is government and industry is not only aware, they're recognizing that they have to address this issue. And these guidelines and standards are a huge step in the right direction. Now, the other part of this uh, sort of evolution uh, started uh, uh, where, where the biggest change took place was back uh, in 2010. But prior to 2010, we were fortunate enough to strike a partnership with a company uh, out of Etobicoke um, to design a window treatment for a building in the city of Markham where they were having a lot of bird collisions occurring. And this is the image you see, it's, it's kind of hard to really distinguish what's going on, but what it was was a transparent window film with rows and rows of, of black dotted lines. And this was based on, on what research said spacing, density of, of markers needed to be to make a window visible to birds. And up go those window treatments as a test and they were getting upwards of around a little over 100 birds a year at this very small single story structure. Well, wouldn't you know it, almost the, the strikes almost disappeared entirely as a result. Now, I, whoops, I don't know what happened there. Uh, oh, there we go. Now, the interesting thing is within that same time period, Flap was asked to be a key witness in the first precedent setting trial where a developer in this case, it was Mekis Developments, was being brought to court over uh, extensive bird death occurring at one of their complexes. The complex was Concilium Place in Scarborough. When this trial took place, um, what a learning experience. I never want to go through that again, because when you get into these, um, these dominating developers' worlds, the lawyers they hire will make Mother Teresa look like the devil. And they go to great lengths to discredit <laughs> whatever the defense might be. And so uh, I, I, it was a pretty grueling experience. But um, the good news is, even though leading up to that trial, with that prototype that we had developed back in 2009 at a structure just around the corner from them, they refused to put that particular marker on their building. Well, wouldn't you know it, midway through the trial, they caved and they started to apply the markers to their buildings. But there was a change in the pattern. And it was a dotted pattern uh, where only the dots are adhered to the window. All the other reflective surface of that, that window is the window itself. Now, this is a pattern that's become increasingly popular right across, right across Canada into the United States because it has upwards of an 80% effective rate at reducing collisions. Um, so out of that trial, the, the courts decided that they had demonstrated due diligence and they were not charged. 
And this was because at the time, until they put that marker up on their window, there really wasn't a commercial grade product available to address this concern. Then there was a second trial where Cadillac Fairview was brought to the courts for the same reason. Extensive bird death was occurring at one of their complexes. Flap again was called in as key witnesses and to testify. And again, midway through the trial, wouldn't you know it, they stuck up the dotted patterns on their windows. <laughs> um, it took years and unfortunately it took them going to court to finally cave and do something. Um, and the unfortunate side of it was that they weren't charged as well. The courts were satisfied that they demonstrated due diligence. But what the judge did was, oh, before I'm jumping ahead of myself, the other good news about Cadillac Fairview and one of their other complexes, in the city of Toronto, we have the TD Centre. It's the iconic TD Centre where there's seven structures that have historically taken thousands and thousands of birds' lives through the years. Um, uh, they retrofitted their entire complex up to the 60 meter level at every one of their structures. And since we've seen a huge reduction in collisions during the day taking place at that facility. Now, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the trials took place, that what the judge did in that trial is he enacted a law. The law sort of already existed where under the Environmental Protection Act, there's a section dedicated to an contaminants where anyone who emits a contaminant that harms or kills a bird and aren't demonstrating due diligence to mitigate that threat, they can be charged under the Environmental Protection Act. The way they did this was they had experts that were able to sit on the stand that said, once daylight reflects off of a window, it's reflected in the form of radiation. Radiation is under the list of contaminants. So it, now it is in fact illegal in the province of Ontario to harm or kill a migratory bird due to a collision with a window. It is also illegal federally if it's a listed species that hits a window. Now, what that means for us is each and every one of us are probably breaking the law in some shape or form. We either live in a home or have a cottage or work in a building with windows and the vast majority of them will not be treated properly to mitigate this concern. The, this law is really designed for those buildings like the Cadillac Fairview and the Menkees where thousands of birds are dying at their structures. They have the means to be able to fix that problem. They have the capital to be able to pay for it and they aren't doing anything about it. And the good news is um, we've ourselves filed some complaints to the ministry and the ministry is responding and they are investigating. And the good news is that typically they don't fight. Uh, the people that are being pursued by the ministry, they go, okay, tell us what to do. And they're retrofitting their buildings. So keep that in mind that if you're aware of a building that is killing massive number of birds in your region, this is something you can use uh, to protect those birds, okay? Now, since that law came out, the ministry tried to wrap their head around how are they going to enact this law when everybody's breaking it? So what they did is they hired the Canadian Standards Association as a starting point. They hired the Canadian Standards Association to write a standard for the province, voluntary for the province, for any municipality to uh, adopt and introduce into their municipality. The problem is it's voluntary. So what we're doing is we're trying to get the provincial building code to adopt the CSA standard. If we manage to be successful with this, and we know that getting the building code to adopt something like this is incredibly challenging, especially under our current political climate with Ford. He's the last person who's going to embrace this. But uh, I, I believe with time, we're gonna be successful. It will be mandatory for all municipalities across the province to have standards in place for new buildings requiring them to be bird friendly. Okay, so let's let's cross our fingers as the months and years go by, we'll see this happen uh, sooner than later. So let me get into how you can actually make the window safe for birds. I'm gonna first dispel a myth. And I compare this to snake oil. 
And, and sorry if some of you have uh, this particular uh, technique on your window. There is uh, a compare, comparing a bird cushion to turn to snake oil is the classic bird of prey decal. This continues to be the go-to, whether it's residential, uh, institutional, or government. They will turn to this particular technique as the be all end all. And unfortunately, Research has demonstrated time and time again that this does absolutely nothing to reduce bird collisions at a window, unless you cover the entire surface of your window with decals. And realistically speaking, nobody's going to do that. Okay, so please try to avoid going down this path because, and, and the, the sad thing is the industries that are producing these products are making money hand over fist and is doing nothing to reduce this problem, okay? So I'm gonna try and give you ideas on how you can do this. And, and to better understand how, how this technique I'm gonna to present to you works, there's two different schools of research that have um, tried to find the best methods possible to truly reduce bird strikes with windows. One is out of, uh, out of a powder mill in, uh, in Pennsylvania through the American Bird Conservancy. They have this flight tunnel. And what they do is on one end of the, this tunnel, they have an opening where they release a bird. On the other end of the tunnel, they have a window where they rotate various markers. Um, one window has markers on it. The uh, other window beside it does it. And basically they count how many times a bird flies right or left, um, and, and they are able to come up with a, a threat rating by uh, uh, recognizing you know, when the bird responds or not to a marker. In front of those windows is a fine mist net. So the birds never have impact with the window. They get caught in that net and then they're released back into the wild. The other technique is a little more, um, for lack of a better term, barbaric, but it is a far more clear, uh, honest rep representation of the real world. And it's out of Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania, where they set up these feeding stations. And adjacent to each of these feeding stations, they roll out these panels of windows. And on the windows, they have various markers. And they count how often a bird actually collides with those markers. And it gives a much more accurate rating of effectiveness because it's a, again it's a far more accurate representation of the real world the problem with a flight tunnel experiment and the best way i can describe it to you would be like you know th these birds are captured in a mist net they're brought to the, this flight tunnel they're released in this dark tunnel so what happens is the bird is in escape mode they're trying to beeline their way out of whatever it is that's happened to them and get out as fast as they can. And it would be like you and I standing on the edge of a cliff and someone's about to push you off that cliff and you have to decide if you're gonna fall into the sand or fall into the rocks. Where this uh, example of bird feeding stations and panels of glass in, in the natural setting, the bird's just doing its thing. It's feeding, eating its seed, it's flying around in the natural environment not feeling any panic, not feeling any sense of urgency to get somewhere. And that's why it has a far more accurate reading. And, and that's in my opinion. I, I have to be honest, I hate the fact that some birds are dying as a result, but it's, it's, just, it's just a more honest representation. So what, what this research has been able to demonstrate time and time again is you have to put a marker on a window and it has to meet a certain density of spacing. It has to cover the entire window and it has to have a strong contrast. And this, using a chickadee as an example, is, is a, a really good way of showing you why it works that way. These birds, they're, they're extremely skilled at flying. They can, fl they can fly through the tightest of spaces. But if that space is too tight, they will try and fly, find a way around what they perceive as an obstacle between them and that reflection of the tree they're trying to get to. And as a result, if you follow this formula, you'll, you'll, you'll have very positive results at reducing strikes. The other thing I mentioned was contrast. If, you're, if you have a window 
and it's reflecting a dark outdoor setting, and you put a dark marker on it, the markers are going to be difficult to see, it, it, as it would be for us as well. What you have to do is you have to use the opposite of the contrast. You need to use a light marker, and it will stand out in the bird's eye much more effectively. And again, the dotted pattern is an example of a pattern that you can purchase. I'll, I'll give, get into that later on as well. Um, uh, if, you're, if your window is reflecting sky, say, or an open field, uh, going to a light marker disappears as well. You need to go to a dark marker. The best possible scenario is duotone because daylight shifts, trees lose leaves, um, the, 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 the available daylight can increase or decrease from month to month, uh, year to year. If you go to duotone where you, have a, where you rotate between a light marker and a dark marker, you will have the best results at making that marker visible to birds, okay? And the images you see in a rotation here on the right-hand side of your screen are just examples of some patterns that um, are and have been applied to windows that are visible enough and meet the spacing and density of the markers necessary uh, for a bird to feel they can't fly through it. The beauty of treating a window is you treat it like a canvas. There are infinite things that you can put on a window to make it visible to birds. It doesn't have to be dots. It doesn't have to be limited to zigzags. It can be anything you want it to be, as long as the spacing, the coverage, and contrast is there for the bird to be able to see it. The other important thing, and this is really important, is the surface of glass that you put the markers on. The vast majority of people place a marker on the window in the worst possible location. And that's typically on the inside of the window. It can be a decal, it can be ribbons that have been hung, it can be your blinds, it can be your drapes. These do help a little bit, but the problem is the outside surface of your window or the first surface of your window continues to reflect. And I'll give you an example of how that works. If you look at the image on the left here, this is just a, an outside view of a, a living space looking into the interior. Um, as the daylight changes and the time of year changes, that transparent window becomes a mirror. So whatever you put behind that window disappears. In fact, the first set of guidelines that were put together in partnership with the city of Toronto, the city decided to allow for uh, second, third, and fourth surface markers. Well, these developers and architects were placing these markers on their windows, but they were using mirrored coatings on the first surface of glass. So whatever the markers they put on the windows were doing nothing <laughs> to reduce bird strikes. So again, very important, place the markers on the outside surface of your windows, okay? Now, some of the products available um, are quite fascinating. The one that industry and members of the public are gravitating toward is ultraviolet light, where you, you do apply patterns to windows, but you do them in transparent UV reflective patterns. And the way this works is um, birds see a spectrum of ultraviolet light that we as humans do not see. And a great way to show how this works is the bird that you see on the right-hand side is how humans see that bird, where the bird you see on the left is how the birds perceive each other. And ultraviolet light is used for in a variety of ways for birds, from attracting their mate, to choosing their breeding territories, to finding the food that they're foraging for. And so the principle or the, the concept of developing markers in ultraviolet became an interest. And this is a, an example, it's hard to see here, but it's a pixie stick pattern by a company called Arnold Glass, where the UV coating, what we see is even less than what you're seeing there. It almost virtually disappears unless you're actively looking for it with the human eye. With the birds, it jumps out at them in a vibrant uh, iridescent pattern. The problem with this particular product 
is they place the marker on the second surface. So again, that first surface reflectivity hides the intensity of, the, of that UV reflection. So until they perfect this, where they can find a way to treat UV markers, apply UV markers to the outside surface of a window, don't fall for it. There's a project out there for homes as well. It's called Window Alert. And they're little decals, transparent, in the shape of maple leaves and butterflies that you can stick to your window. Um, the, the UV marker that they put on that transparent film does not meet the criteria for the proper UV reflectivity. I won't get into the detail of it. This is the formula. Um, but the bottom line is those UV decals called window alert also, they do not do the job. And even if they did do the job, you still have to cover almost the entire surface of your window with those decals for it to become visible to the birds, okay? So try to avoid the UV decal approach and, and look more closely at um, what we know works. So first I'm gonna start with commercial grade uh, bird collision deterrent techniques. First one is window fill, uh, where you can put a dotted pattern on the windows like the one I showed you before, or you can do some very ornate die cut designs in window film, where they're, again, they're adhered to the exterior surface of the window. The other is fritting, where they bake the marker right into the glass as part of the fabrication process. Now, prior to the trial that I mentioned to you, fritting was only manufactured on the inside surface of glass because they could not uh, figure out a way to apply that fritting to the outside to withstand the elements. Well, wouldn't you know it, supply and demand, with all these mandatory requirements coming in place for bird-friendly design, they figured out how to frit surface, first surface fritted patterns on windows. So that, that's, that's a, a technique you can use. There's also digital printing and etching patterns that you can apply to windows, uh, exterior sunshades, retractable blinds on the outside of the building. There's also grill work, that uh, very decorative grill work, uh, commercial grade pattern grill work that can be hung in front of a building's facade. And then there's also silk screen. Um, again, much like um, digital printing on glass as well. When it comes to homes, it's a little more simplified. Um, where you can do your own thing or you can you can buy certain product. Um, you can buy uh, shelving paper and you stick it to the window uh, outside your home. The problem with a product like shelving paper is it isn't designed to ex withstand exterior uh, treatments. However, the dotted pattern I mentioned to you before, there's a company called Feather Friendly. Featherfriendly.org is their website. And they manufacture this dotted pattern and a few other patterns designed specifically for outdoor applications. And again, they have upwards of 80% or greater success rate through their product. It's affordable as well. You buy a roll of this tape and you apply it to your, your window based on their instructions. A roll of tape is roughly $18 full price, which would treat ab about uh, this equivalent to a patio sliding door unit. So it treats a lot of area. It's relatively easy to apply. It's very inexpensive considering, and it does the job, okay? So there's window films. There's also a little bit more of a primitive approach, whitewashing, where you just dilute white paint and you brush it onto your window, but you can't see through your window when you do this. However, it is extremely effective. <laughs> at reducing strikes. The other is just drawing patterns on your own windows. This is a, a pattern of, of uh, maple leaves that were drawn on a window. Again, keeping in mind the density of spacing and full coverage. You can also buy exterior sunshades for your home. And there's a company called, uh, I think it's Sunshades, I think is the company. Um, by the way, all these techniques are mentioned on, on our website, flap.org, and there's links to those various products if you're interested in just purchasing them yourself, okay? So sunshades also work outside your window. Um, grill work, again, can be applied to the outside of your window. 
And then there's cable systems. There's a, there's a company called um, Ocopium Bird Savers, where you hang parachute cord from the top of your window down to the very bottom of your window in sequential order, roughly four um, inches apart, 10 centimeters apart from each other is how they sell it. And uh, what these cables do is they don't only hang in front of the window, they move a little bit. The wind blows them, you know, the outdoor exposure moves them a little bit and creates a moving object as well for the bird to avoid. Those have been extremely effective at, uh, at reducing bird strikes. Um, now, keep this in mind. Bird feeders are a culprit for increasing the potential for bird, bird collisions at your home. No, I'm not saying you get rid of your bird feeders. What people tend to do, however, is they place their bird feeders in the worst possible location. And they do, which means they, they place these feeders on average about five meters from a window. And the problem with that distance is, as you attract more birds to come to your backyard, they land on these feeders. And when they fly away from those feeders, they, they gain enough momentum on the distance between the feeder and your window itself, that when they hit your window, they, they can have a fatal impact with that window. So the key here is, if you, have, if you have bird feeders, the best location is right up against your window. And uh, by doing that, you're reducing that threat significantly. But more importantly, or equally important, is make sure your windows are treated as well, because it won't stop your bird collision problem by placing your feeders up against the window. It just reduces the volume of strikes, or it reduces the, the level of injury to that bird, okay? And then there's cats. Cats, as I'm sure you know, um, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, is the leading cause of bird death across Canada, across North America. Um, we basically dropped this natural or this predator into an environment that is, it really isn't designed to be in in the first place. They're let outdoors, they're healthy, they're strong. Um, and in many cases, they're not hunting to survive. They're hunting through instinct and they're hunting for pleasure. And uh, you know, this is an issue we have control over. Um, it's just, if you're a cat owner and that cat is used to being outdoors, it's a real exercise in patience to climatize it, to get used to living indoors. If you're thinking of getting a cat, never let it outside. Uh, if we take the bird uh, issue, if we put the bird issue aside, it's inhumane. Cats in the outdoor environment, they're not designed to live outdoors. They, they, they get struck by vehicles. They, they pick up diseases from other cats. Um, you know, it's just a, it's a, a, a horrific world for a domesticated animal to live in. If you, if anything, protect your pet by keeping it indoors. Um, a quick story, I can, I'll give you two quick stories about cats. The only time I've ever struck and killed an animal with my vehicle, it was a cat. It broke my heart. I pulled over, I picked that cat up, and I was in the middle of nowhere in the Caledon region, and there were two homes relatively close to where I found, I had struck this cat. I went to the first door, I knocked on the door, I'm holding this cat, the door opens up, a man answers the door and he says, well, before you say anything, I know whose cat that is, it isn't mine, it's my neighbor's. I told him all the time, keep your cat indoors. So I went next door, I knock on the door, I'm holding the cat and I thought, oh, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that in the first place. I set the cat down out of sight, Came back to the door, the door opens and a little girl answers the door. And I asked, is your father or your mother here? And the father came to the door and I asked this gentleman, is, is this your cat? And he goes, and, and the first thing he said, I'll never forget this. He said, ah, damn it. Now I have to buy another cat. That was his first response. <laughs> I, I, I did everything I could to not get angry at this person. Um, but this is also part of, of the domesticated pet owning world. To a degree, these are replaceable creatures. You can always go out to a humane society and adopt another one, right? 
And, and it's a mindset we got to get away from. We've got to do everything we can to create a, a, a safe environment, not only for the birds, but for our pets as well. Okay. That's enough of a rant. <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next slide. Back to bird window collisions. Um, one of the things that we've been asked the years is how can I figure out which of my windows are, has the potential to kill the most birds' lives? So we developed this online survey where you answer 23 different questions, yes or no. And at the end of answering all these questions, it will give you a threat rating for the window that you are assessing. And we say that any structure or any window you assess that is a high risk to a lethal level, get on the internet and buy product to treat your windows, okay? Uh, because they are, they are a high risk and a high likelihood for bird strikes. And that's what this app is designed to do, is to help you kind of narrow down which of the windows at your home are most important to treat, okay? Oh, and by the way, I should go, go back to that. Let me just go back to that slide. This particular survey can be found uh, on our birdsafe.ca website. Okay, there's a little section there that you can click on, take the survey, and um, and away you go. All right. The other the, the the URL the direct URL you can take to get to this app is also bird. Well, what is it? Flapapp.ca. Flapapp.ca. Okay. Now. The other thing you can do, and this is really important, um, where we can all contribute. We introduced something called the Global Bird Collision Mapper. This is an online web-based, uh, sorry, not a web-based, it's an online GIS mapping database where you register with this app and you can enter a bird collision from anywhere around the world. So what it does is it locates you Use, using a cell phone and using this app, it locates you and you'll be able to, next thing you'll see that you're standing almost right in front of the very building where you found that bird. You click on the side of the building where you found that bird and it drops a record. You take a photograph of that bird and it, it's included in that record and it all goes into the larger database. And this is a kind of a, a global view of, of uh, the numbers that are starting to accumulate since we released this app. Uh, we're now at 88,000 birds uh, in, in this database and it grows day by day. People from all over the world are, are beginning to use this database. The, the thing about this database is it, it falls under what they call community science, where just members of the public participate in these very simple surveys, very simple studies, the mapper is an example of that. The thing about citizen science is it's becoming uh, a, a high in demand in the research world. They're, they're relying on citizen science now to help them better understand different issues across the globe. So you, you by entering, entering a bird collision that you may have found at your home or your cottage or your workplace into this database is extremely valuable information. So please do consider using this app if you ever uh, find a bird collision, okay? Um, also, in using this app, we introduce uh, a, an initiative called Global Bird Rescue, where um, at a certain time of the year, and this year it's February, uh, sorry, October 5th to October 11th, we um, ask people to go out into their community and look for birds that collide with windows. Now, you can do this just by sitting on your armchair at your home, or you can go right into uh, a city uh, uh, um, environment and monitor different buildings in that environment during that week-long period. You don't have to go out all week long. You don't have to go out 24 hours a day. You can go out just once throughout that event and you're still participating in the event. But the, the goal is we educate people across the globe through this, through this program and we get people out there actively looking for birds in their community and entering into this database. So if your group is ever interested in participating, just create a team through our globalbirdrescue.org website and uh, set the time aside during that week-long period and participate. 
And uh, again, it's just, we're, we're now, um, we now have dozens of different groups across the world participating in this event. And there's even more participants uh, on that list than were there before. So it's growing in popularity and we're getting more and more people out there looking and more and more outreach across the globe. So please do consider that for this year uh, participating in the event, okay? Now, I'm getting close to finishing here and I always kind of close on, on this particular slide. People uh, don't really understand how much birds contribute to our, our, our safety, our health, and uh, us being humans. Um, the birds that we pick up that are climbing the buildings play a major role in creating a healthy natural environment from contro controlling our insect populations to pollinating our plants, distributing seeds and, and providing food for other forms of wildlife. But the other side of this coin is the bird watching industry. Bird watching is a multi-billion dollar industry across North America. Now, when we use the term bird watcher, the average individual pictures someone with a tilly hat and binoculars and a bird book. But the fact is, if you have a bird feeder in your backyard, you're a bird watcher. Uh, in fact, do this for yourself. Just keep your eye open when you're going into a grocery store or uh, you know, a big box store or even a corner store. Of all the product they can sell, I guarantee you one of them is going to be bird seed and bird feeders. And it's because it rolls off the shelf. People are constantly buying this product. Um, the other uh, part of, of the bird watching industry that's, um, oh, and I, I will mention this. It's not just the binoculars they purchase and the bird books, if they're traveling from different areas to observe birds. It's the hotels they stay in when they go to those places. It's the plane, the flights they take to get there. People fly from all over the world to go to Point Pelee in the spring. Um, you know, it's the hotels they're staying in. It's the gifts they're buying when they're away. All this is generating capital. Then there's the bird uh, collision deterrent industry. It's new, but it's growing and it's growing fast. There's so many different products that are appearing on the landscape now that this is also introducing a whole new industry that didn't exist before, which is creating a healthy economic environment for us. So all the more reason we really do need to to protect these birds, not just for their beauty of their song and their plumage and enjoyment of observing them in the wild. We're, we're saving our own rear ends, quite frankly, by, by protecting these birds, okay? And with that, I'll close. Um, 